Hey, you know what I haven't done in a while? One of those top 10 lists. Yeah, top 10 worst songs of random year. Yeah, that would be fun, right? That's always fun, looking at the horribly dated fashion trends of past decades and the ridiculous other things generations listened to in the past. Okay, time travelers, put on your poodle skirts and your leisure suits because we're taking a nostalgia ride in the Wayback Machine all the way to the far off year of... Huh. Okay. Peace up, A-Town Down. Okay, I realize this is less than a decade ago, but 2004 is fading from memory more quickly than you probably realize. Howard Dean was a viable presidential candidate, people cared about Janet Jackson's breasts, lolcats didn't exist yet, and while I personally spent most of 2004 listening to Modest Mouse and The Killers, that's not really reflected in Billboard's list of the year's hottest songs. No, for the public at large, 2004 was the year of crunk. There's some other stuff in there, but more than half this list is down and dirty hip-hop party jams. We were shaking it like a salt shaker and or Polaroid picture, depending on the song. It wasn't like today, where the charts are largely the domain of the Katy Perry's and Rihanna's. No, 2004 belonged to the Dirty South. And it all disappeared surprisingly quickly. I wasn't a chart watcher in 04 like I am now, but I have absolutely no knowledge of a distressing number of these songs. And I'm guessing many of them mean nothing to most of you, too, unless names like Lil Flip, Nina Sky, or Ryan Cabrera ring any bells for you. All the same, 2004 holds a special place for me. That was the year that some awful Simple Plan song inspired me to start bitching about music on my live journal, which I did for many years before I eventually converted it to video. Yes, this is basically the year that Todd in the Shadows was born. The birth of a legend. Alright, enough wasting time. Let's get it started in here. We're counting down. Girl, this is my sorry for 2004. The top 10 worst hit songs of 2004. Yeah, I'm gonna take this one chance and make it real clear. I'm sorry. Number 10. Sorry. Is this chicken what I have or is this fish? I know it's tuna, but it, it says chicken by the sea. There. After 13 years and a billion paparazzi photos, there you have Jessica Simpson's only major contribution to pop culture, being outsmarted by a canned food label. In 2003, Jessica Simpson launched her career as a reality star, one which she apparently continues to this day. But believe it or not, she actually started her career as a singer, and she actually had some success in it. Not success anyone remembers, but you know, success. Yes, the newly de-virginized Jessica Simpson went forth that year to put out a new sexy image, but by 2004, as R&B took over, the pop scene had utterly no clue what to do with its regular pop princesses. I can only assume this one charted because of Jessica's publicity buzz from her TV show, but it is easily the worst Jessica Simpson song I've ever heard. And I've listened to lots and lots of Jessica Simpson. You speak and it's like a song, and just like that all my walls come down. It's like a private joke. And oddly enough, Jessica never really seemed particularly comfortable as a pop singer. Certainly not on this she doesn't. It's, listen to this song, it's herky-jerky, it's got this weird rhyme scheme. It sounds more like an inept mashup than anything else. I mean, Jessica Simpson is a belter. She knows how to do this. Not so good at this. More than that, I'm a little annoyed that this completely synthetic piece of tripe is Jessica presenting herself as the real her, and you're cutting through the layers of showbiz to see who she really is. Right. No. This is so calculated, it was written on a TI-83. Chances are that even her husband never met the real Jessica. I certainly don't buy that this malformed piece of fluff is anything real. I can say crazy, no, 
look how down home and real she is. She's not a living, breathing publicity machine at all. She's just Jessica from the block. Whatever. Number nine. Now, like I said, I was only listening to rock music in 04, so I was a little shocked at how little there was of it on this list. Why is the rock so unrepresented? Surely we had someone to be our standard bearer of rock and roll. Oh. Well, God, no wonder this genre was dying. How the hell do we wind up like this? Why weren't we able No, no, that's a good question, Chad. How did we? How did we end up like this every single year of the Bush administration, like clockwork, with another completely awful Nickelback single stinking up the radio? Nickelback were always a terrible band from the very beginning, but it was right around this year that they began building their reputation not just as a bad band, but as the worst band of all time. Somewhere there's somebody who will tell you that the critics were too harsh on them, but that person is not me. Now, their big hit in 2004 was called Someday, and it was mainly only notable for being a shit-blisteringly blatant recycling of their first big hit, so much so that one amazing remix just played them side by side for comparison. Why they would want to recycle a song that was off to begin with is beyond me. People use the term butt rock to refer to a lot of things, but I think it best applies to Chad Kroger, because he literally sounds like a butt. That, more than anything, is the key component in Nickelback's rock bottom reputation. The fact that Kroger the Ogre sounds like he's singing directly out of his colon. Every single song he just wails like that. How do you think he answers the phone? Also, this is a minor nitpick, but the lyrics suck too. Yeah, he's gonna make it right, but not right now. I mean, the game's on. I can't wait. Jeez. And the sad part is that Nickelback would go on to get worse. Much worse. Than someday. I mean, this was before they were dropping six singles from an album at a time. This wound up low on the list simply because Nickelback can do so much worse. As one of the few people on earth who can distinguish between different Nickelback songs, I can tell you that just off the top of my head, I can think of seven songs they had worse than this. Any other band, this would be the worst thing they ever did. Just another day from Nickelback. Number 8. This is not about Beyonce. I know I already said I'm not a Beyonce fan. Never was, probably never will be. That said, she did have at least a couple songs I liked. This obviously isn't one of them, but this isn't about her. Reggae star Sean Paul is featured more on this song than Miss B is, but it's not about him either, although it was pretty easy to get sick of Sean Paul that year. No, this is about a chubby white boy named Scott Storch. Scott Storch was a keyboard player for The Roots, and then he was an underling of producer Timbaland, and then he struck out making beats on his own, and he was very successful for a few years. I bring him up because he absolutely sucked. I blame every shitty dance song I heard between 03 and 06 on him. I couldn't stand a single song he touched, mostly because all his shit sounded exactly the same. Some vaguely world music sounding Indian riff or something, add hip hop beat, done. Anyone could have done it, but Scott went the extra mile by making the most shrink wrapped, sterile beat so utterly devoid of life or fun that, ugh. When we had guys like the Neptunes, Timbaland making actual fun music, I have no idea why we tolerated this tubby, talentless hack making our hits. One would expect such a force of personality as Beyonce to liven things up, but see, Here's the thing, Beyonce's good at explaining why she's awesome, or destroying some inferior specimen of man. If only she brought that kind of energy to this. On love songs, more than a few times she just seems to clock out, which is why she seems like non-presence on this song. Scott Storch eventually flamed out MC Hammer style in a cloud of cocaine, lawsuits, and ridiculous outfits. I choose to believe it was karma. 
And Lord knows whatever happened to Beyonce. Did anyone ever hear from her again? <laughs> Probably not, I bet. Number seven. Would that this have been one of the songs from this year I don't remember. Of course, I don't know how that would happen because in that year and every year since, the reason by Hoobastank has been one of the most wretchedly overplayed songs that's ever existed. Hoobastank were honestly not a terrible band. They were pretty clear incubus wannabes, yes, but I didn't have anything against them at all. And yet, I developed an allergic reaction to the reason almost immediately. Plenty of hard rock bands released terrible ballads, but at least back in the 80s it was cheesy and over the top. The reason, however, is a worst of both worlds scenario, combining the ugly sludgy sound of a Nickelback song with the vapid hacky lyrics of a Peter Cetera ballad. Just listen as master poet Doug Robb finds just the right words to express the idea that he's not a perfect person. and weaves romantic tapestry of imagery to show that he's sorry that he hurt you. I'm sorry that I hurt you. And finds a new spin on the tired, insincere cliché, I never meant to do those things to you. I never meant to do those things to you. Genius. Yeah, this guy's not any better at apologizing than Nickelback. Although at the very least, he's a better singer than Chad Kroger. Usually. It's just not a very convincing song. Oh, I never meant to do those things. I'm not gonna say which things, you know, those things. Whatever those things are. Maybe he, I, I don't know, sold her dog and slept with all her friends. You can't change who you used to be, dumbass. The song starts with a guy saying he isn't perfect, and then he goes on to prove it. Hoobastank immediately disappeared after the biggest hit, and yet, despite Hoobastank's lack of further success, the reason persists in all its dull, gray awfulness. For the love of God, why won't it just go away? This song, Hooba, sucks. Number 6. Hot in her, 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 whatever. Nelly wasn't exactly a great rapper, but he was an original. The first rapper to break out of the Midwest, one with a unique sing-song flow and a strange way of bending words. Naturally, after Nelly's second album went multi-platinum in 02, ripoffs started showing up almost immediately. This guy's name was Chingy, or possibly Chingy, I'm not sure. Like Nelly, he came from St. Louis. Like Nelly, he didn't seem overburdened with intelligence. Unlike Nelly, I don't think anyone ever liked him. One of the amazing things about the internet is that you can find someone who can make a decent defense of just about anybody in the world. But Chingy was one of the few people I remember who the entire consensus said was just crap. And just like Hooba Stank above, he was at his worst when he was trying to be romantic. Chingy was one of those guys whose entire idea of romance came from internet porn videos. He didn't exactly liven things up with great lyrics or amazing flow. In fact, his voice is by far the worst thing about him. He seems shocked by everything he says. Seriously, is Urkel dubbing this guy? Does he have a case of the hiccups or what? Look, don't creep on girls at the bank or the grocery store or whatever, jeez. Here, let me sum up this entire song for you. I sent that bitch a smiley face. Bitches love smiley faces. You know what else is one call away? Irrelevance. Girl, this is my sorry for. 2004 Number 5 
Okay, now who the hell is this puke? Okay, this is Lloyd. Never heard of him. Well, that's an excellent Marilyn Monroe impression he's doing. This guy's a singer, really? Because he's singing like he has a bad case of hay fever and a pipe wrench tightened on his nuts. Granted, not everything about Southside by Lloyd is terrible. It's got a nice, soft, romantic guitar and the beautiful voice of Ashanti, who I was never even really a fan of, which just absolutely blows Lloyd out of the water here. And yet the positive parts of this song just highlight how completely terrible Lloyd is. This is a song about the two of them arranging a romantic rendezvous away from the eyes of her dad, who disapproves of his jerseys and braids and the fact that he looks like a cast member of Breaking 2 Electric Boogaloo. It's funny that they mention this overprotective dad, because this song kind of forces you into that role, trying to protect your beautiful girl from running off with a guy who's nowhere near good enough for her. Again, I wasn't even a fan of her, but I hear this and I feel like, son, that little girl there's my princess, and if you even got even half a mind to touch a hair on her head, I want you to know I got a shotgun and I know how to use it. You keep that in mind, son. But I mean, he was 18 at the time. No wonder he sounds like that. He could barely drive. I'm sure now that he's in his late 20s, he's got some bass in his voice. Huh, I guess not. What else has he done? Oh wait, it's that guy! The bedrock douche! He sung the hook on one of the worst songs I've ever reviewed. And although everyone involved deserves some of the blame, especially Gutta Gutta, most of all I hated the singer. It's kind of comforting to know that he always sucked. Oh baby, Georgetown Hoyas. Big East Conference. I'm gonna fill out your March Madness bracket. Oh. Girl, this is my sorry for 2004. Number four. This song. I did not realize that before. Why didn't I, this song is awful? How did I? How did I not notice? I mean, must have heard it a billion times, and I guess I just kind of thought, you know, it's funny. They they sing it in dodgeball. It's 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 really bad. Kalise, um, she basically just ended up the world's warm up for Fergie, and uh, this was her biggest hit, and it's. Holy crap, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's just terrible. It's just it's just flat out freaking crap. I mean, am I crazy? Okay, so, um, Khalees is proud of her milkshake. We never ever really found out what her milkshake was. Apparently, its recipe is worth something. I'm guessing she means more than the $2.59 it costs at McDonald's. Look, I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm just dumbfounded. I, I really didn't know I hated this song so much. It's, it's, it's unlistenable. It's, it sounds like garbage. It's disjointed. It's awful. It's, it's just noise. It's the, it's the worst thing that Neptune's ever made. Am I, am I the only one who noticed this? Milkshake? Brings all the boys to the yard and milkshake? I drink your milk. I don't, I don't know what to say. I assume people who hate it now hate it because they just got sick of it. I mean, I wasn't sick of it. It just sucks. It just plainly, obviously sucks. Right? Number three. Now, like I said, a large chunk of the Hot 100 this year was Crunk and B party jams. I'd have put more of them on here if I could tell them apart. Mostly, they're just mediocre. On top of that, they're all pretty vapid. It really does make a person wish someone would inject some substance into this genre. 
Enter salvation from an unlikely source. Nothing but the hotness whenever we drop this monotonous for y'all to keep hating. Yes, New York rapper Jada Kiss, member of the Locks, affiliated with DMX, mostly known as a gangster rapper, but who set aside his normal MO for his best charting single, a song where he asked hard questions about society, racism, politics, the music industry, and many other topics. It was called Why. Like I said, it was a serious departure from the mindless trends of its time, so why is why on this list? Well, despite its admirable intentions, it had one itty bitty issue. Jada Kiss was a moron. Why is Jada Kiss as hard as it gets? Why is the industry designed to keep the artists in debt? Look, he tried. He tried. But it turns out some people just stick to what they know, because Jada Kiss is well out of his depth. While some of the questions might be worth answering, Why they stop letting brothers get degrees in jail? turns out a lot of these questions are things that only he cares about, Why I can't come through when the pecan jack. or shouldn't care about. Why at the bar you don't take straight shots instead of popping crisps? What business is it of yours, jerk? Let me drink. Or he's asking questions that just reveal his own ignorance. Why do we have to let a white man pop to get an Oscar? Why Denzel have to be crooked before he took it? Why you know that Denzel had an Oscar before training day, right? Why they ain't give us a cure for AIDS? Because they just don't like you, Jada Kiss. There are scientists out there specifically withholding the cure for AIDS from you. Why my buzz in LA ain't like it is in New York? Because you're a New York rapper, duh. A-Rod doesn't walk around wondering why he's not as popular in Boston, you dumbass. Why they come up with the witness protection? Why they let the Terminator win the election? Come on, stupid question after stupid freaking question. Why you gotta do 85% of your time? Why you in stack instead of trying to be fly? Why they never get it popping but they party to death? Fucking magnets, how do they work? Look, you want thoughtful rap, go to Common or Lupe Fiasco or Most Def. Don't go to Jadakiss, who thinks this is an insightful commentary on current events. Why do people push pounds and powder? Why did Bush knock down the towers? Oh. Why did Bush knock down the towers? Oh, you're one of those, huh? Well, he did it because the Illuminati needed him to cover up the CIA's mind control program, or whatever the hell your crazy ass believes. Why did Kobe have to hit that raw? Why he kissed that whore? Why? You mean the alleged rape victim? That whore? Here's a question for you. Why don't you go eat a dick? Girl, this is my sorry for 2004. Number two. Okay, look. I'm not a prude. I am not opposed to cursing. I don't get offended when someone drops an F-bomb in front of me, as long as it's done correctly. See, there's a way to do it properly, and then there's doing it wrong. And then there's doing it wrong. Don't remember this song? It was big. It went to number one in nine countries. No, I don't remember it either. But let me introduce you to the man singing a doofy Staten Island douche named Eamon. This is like listening to that graduation song by Vitamin C with a colicky baby screaming curse words over it. I guess his girl cheated on him, so he dumped her, and he's rejecting her attempts to get back with her. No, 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 actually, no, here's what I'm guessing actually happened. He got cheated on, then he got dumped by her, and then this is him writing a song about how he wished it went down. Fuck all those kisses, they didn't mean jack. It's honestly too pathetic to be offended by. There can't be a single person who ever listened to this and grooved to it unironically. This is the kind of thing VH1 awesomely bad countdowns were made for. Even if you do like it ironically, and from research that's the only people I can find who do like the song, even if you like it ironically, we already have a much better F.U. song written by a much better artist that's funny on purpose, and you can listen to it without guilt. I might have to do a further episode on this, because I'm looking and, uh, this guy's album included such unfairly ignored potential hits as Get Off My Dick, I Love Them Hoes, and Ass Is Fat. Fuck you, you hope. I don't want you back. 
And no one anywhere wanted you back either, Eamon. At least you have this one great song as your legacy. Number one. It feels bizarre that I should assign the number one song on this list to by far its most talented artist. But you know what? It's inevitable. Everyone's got a bad one in them, and any artist that doesn't die young will eventually run out of steam at some point. They get old. They get complacent. No one can keep the fire burning forever. It happens. But until the end of my days, I don't think I will ever, ever see such a shocking drop in quality as this. You broke my heart, Marshall. You broke my heart. I'm gonna make you dance. It's your chance. Yeah, boy, shake that thing. Oops, I mean, girl. Girl, girl, girl. You remember in Space Jam when aliens secretly stole the talent from NBA stars and suddenly those players completely sucked? I can only assume something similar happened to Eminem in 2004 because I can't come up with a single better explanation for what happened to Slim. The song was called Just Lose It, and Eminem just lost it. All of a sudden, Eminem had become everything his critics always said he was. Witless, unfunny, obnoxious, and trying too hard to shock. And what was shocking about Eminem when he first came out is that he genuinely seemed as angry and violent as he came off. You could tell right from the beginning of Just Lose It though that Eminem wasn't trying anymore. Oh, so shocking. No one actually believes you're going to molest children, M. It was the first Eminem song that was actually as bad as an insane clown posse song. Eminem was supposed to be vicious, angry, dangerous, not this. MC Hammer, Michael Jackson, Beavis and Butthead references? How sad is this? If he made a Lorena Bobbitt joke, it'd actually make the song more timely. More importantly, what happened to his flow? Just a year before, this was the Eminem I knew. And now we got... That wasn't a rap, that was a statement of contempt for you, the listener. M, that was pathetic. What do you have to say for yourself? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? R, 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 you say? Just checking. After the unmitigated disaster that was the entire Encore album, Eminem wisely decided to sit out the rest of the decade. After a flop attempt at a comeback, Eminem finally regained some kind of form in 2010. He's still not as good as he was in his prime, but at least he's not this. Then again, the fact that this exists at all was probably evidence of intentional career sabotage. I don't miss 2004, and I'm betting Eminem doesn't either. 